It's a great joy to introduce to you Gregory Vaughn Palmer. Now, those of us who were at Duke Divinity School in the late 1970s remember Greg very well. We give thanks that through the great providence of God, uh, Greg and his wife, Cynthia, came to Duke Divinity School. And they have deep ties here in North Carolina. All these years later, the parents of two young adult children, uh, both of those children live in Charlotte. And so they come to North Carolina whenever, whenever they can. There are many things that can be said about Bishop Palmer, but the things I want to say to you are less about his biographical information. You can Google him and find out that he was a, born and reared in the city of Philadelphia, his father a pastor, United Methodist pastor, his mother a teacher. He went to the public schools there and then to George Washington University in Washington, D.C. before coming to Duke Divinity School to be among us for a season. After his election as bishop, Bishop Palmer has become beloved across the church. Last year when we did evaluations of annual conference, a number of them said, we've enjoyed the teaching, but we love good preaching. Get us a really good preacher. The first person who came to mind was Bishop Gregory Vaughn Parker Palmer. He, where did that come from? He has a persona larger than life. He is filled with the Spirit. I love to hear him preach because he is so articulate about the power, the grace, and the mercy of God. It is said that the Council of Bishops don't agree on things, but friends, I will tell you when we decided who would deliver the Episcopal address at the General Conference in Portland, it was unanimous that Gregory Vaughn Palmer <laughs> would be the one to articulate for us the vision of the church. It's with great delight that I present to you, my friend, my colleague, your friend, our brother in Christ, Bishop Palmer. Come and preach to us. <laughs> Thank you, Bishop Hope Morgan Ward. It's a great privilege to be with you, uh, dear colleague and friend, and, uh, and with all of you, the saints of the North Carolina Conference. You all are kind of spread out on a wide-angled view here, and, um, but I know you can see me, so uh, if, uh, if it appears I'm not looking right at you, you'll understand stand why. But thank you for the generous and warm invitation from your bishop and from your annual conference uh, sessions committee, and for the opportunity uh, that has happened already to connect with so many people that uh, I've done part of life with, um, back in seminary days and uh, through the life of the United Methodist Church uh, since we left those uh, hallowed halls and to meet new friends and colleagues that I have not known nearly before. So thank you for this wonderful and generous opportunity and uh, I know you rushed back from dinner and um, I'll try to use your time wisely. I know uh, some of you, some of us, uh, have a small investment in the playoff game tonight and um, <laughs> It's, uh, it's an emotional investment uh, rather than a financial one. But uh, if you're from Ohio, you look and uh, uh, Cleveland needs a win in more ways than one. And uh, so uh, at any rate, uh, thank you for this, this opportunity. I want to read to you a few passages of scripture, uh, one passage, but a few verses. And I'm in uh, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at the first verse. So a person should think about us in this way, as servants of Christ and managers of God's secrets. In this kind of situation, what is expected of a manager is that they prove to be faithful. I couldn't care less if I'm judged by you or by any human court. I don't even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against me but that doesn't make me innocent because the Lord is the one who judges me. So don't judge anything before the right time. Wait until the Lord comes. God will bring things that are hidden in the dark to light, and God will make people's motivations public. 
then there will be recognition for each person from God. Brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. I've done this so that you can learn what it means not to go beyond what has been written, and so no, none of you will become arrogant by supporting one of us against the other. Who says that you are better than anyone else? What do you have that you didn't receive? And if you received it then, why are you bragging as if you didn't receive it? You've been filled already. You've become rich already. You rule like kings without us. I wish you did rule so that we could be kings with you. I suppose that God has shown that we apostles are at the end of the line. We are like prisoners sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle in the world, both to angels and to humans. We are fools for Christ, but you are wise through Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored and we are dishonored. Up to this very moment, we are hungry, thirsty, wearing rags, abused, and homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are insulted, we respond with a blessing. When we are harassed, we put up with it. When our reputation is attacked, we are encouraging. We have become the scum of the earth, the waste that runs off everything up to the present time. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Grant, O oh God, in this moment and in all the moments of our lives that the words of our mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts will find acceptance in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Now, I want to put you at your ease and assure you that I have no intention of trying to unpack all 13 of those verses. I could feel you squirming as some of them were read. But because I had a good theological education at Duke, I felt it was incumbent upon me to read the whole pericope. How about that? So now that we have that out of the way, and that you have been indeed put at your ease, I'd like to tell you what I'd like to say concerning this larger text. The first thing is to background it just a little bit. And have you given any thought recently to how relevant the letters in the New Testament, particularly those of Paul, but not exclusive to him, are to the times in which we live, particularly the way in which we are church or the ways in which we fail? to be church. I am amazed at how much time the writers of the New Testament, beyond the Gospels in particular, had to spend on helping the Christians get their act together. When I was in Iowa, we had a judicatory colleague who was the Archbishop of, uh, the, of the Diocese of Dubuque of the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, he, he had a, a, a wonderful story about how he became a bishop. You don't have that much time tonight. But uh, uh, let me suffice it to say, the, the truncated version is, he was a monk, the head of his order, and was running a retreat center in northern Missouri when the call came from the, popal, the papal nuncio in Washington that he was going to be made a bishop. It was unbelievable to him. His first, second, and third response was no. He hang, hung up the phone three times, believing that it was his seminary schoolmates who were playing a trick on him, because during the seminary years, of course, they had competitively compared notes about who among them might be lifted up for larger leadership. But he had chosen the life of a monastery to become the head of his order, to run the retreat center, and the prayerful, quiet life of a monk. But as God or the Pope or both would have it, he became a bishop 
and an archbishop at that of the Diocese of Dubuque. And he used to say to us when we would gather as judicatory leaders that he had to find biblical and theological rationale, number one, for why he was in the job, and number two, why God needed bishops in the first place. And he said that he had begun to make a case out of the writings of the New Testament that God gave to the church bishops, I don't know if you knew this, Bishop Hope, to keep Christians from killing one another. <laughs> I don't know. But I spend a lot of my time in the middle of conflict. Of course, some people think we're the ones stirring up the conflict, but that's, a, that's another sermon on another occasion. But the point is, the New Testament letters spend so much time helping Christians to frame what it means to live a shared and a common life that is completely devoted to bearing witness to what God in Jesus Christ has done and is doing in the church and in the world. And we are so easily distracted as God's people in Christ from the main thing. And so we get sideways with one another. Now, I know this never happens in the North Carolina conference, but I know some conferences somewhere. And I know it never happens in any of your churches, but I know some churches where people get sideways with one another. And we play these little or large games about who's more important, whose role, whose responsibility, whose gifts, etc., etc., etc. So part of what Paul is doing when he's addressing, particularly in 1 Corinthians, is dealing with matters of church division and conflict. Because they are at a stuck place for a variety of reasons, but among that litany of reasons is that they have gotten into partisan ecclesiastical politics. And so he spends a great deal of his energy trying to say, look at it in this way. Look at the example that myself and Apollos and others have tried to be for you and tried to give to you. And here in the fourth chapter, he has been moved to the place of defending his own apostleship. And he talks a little bit on the front end and the back end about his credentials. <laughs> but as a way of summoning the people and sobering them up about who and whose they are and who they've been called to be and what it is they've been called to do. We come upon these verses in the text. I told you I didn't want to do the whole thing. And he says to them, after all, sisters and brothers, what do you have that you have not received? What about your life and your ministry <laughs> is really yours? is of your own making and your own conceiving. Sometimes even those of us, and that would be all of us, who believe that we're sort of at the heart of things and we're near to the truth of the gospel and the mission of the church, we lose sight of whose enterprise and movement this is in the first place. And Paul's words are echoing down the corridors of time and eternity, asking of us in this time and place, before we get to the giving proposition, what do you have that you haven't received as a gift? I mean, does not the word say elsewhere, <laughs> naked you came into this world and you're going out the same way, so to speak? Our lives are a huge, enormous gift. No matter how long, how short, how troubled or untroubled, they are a gift. And what we have received as a part of the cycle of life in the created order is beyond our capacity to really articulate it. 
We can study it. We can understand it better. But at the end of the day, we've got to step back, and it's a matter of awe and wonder about the marvelous works of God. No wonder we sing out with such gusto, how great thou art. When we think about who God is and what God has given to all of creation. And the question echoes again, what do you have that you did not receive? Occasionally you'll hear something on the news cycles and usually in some conflicted uh, political partisan jargon that refers to someone as a self-made person. I'm always frightened by self-made people. I mean, I get what people are probably in a clumsy way trying to articulate that this person came from proverbially nothing and now look at what they have. But I say to you, there are no self-made people. We are all gifts from God. Our own lives are a gift. My, my, my wife's home church pastor, he's now gone on to glory, used to say, do you understand that even the breath you breathe is borrowed? If one takes a poetic reading of the creation accounts and you stop over by James Weldon Johnson, who at the end of his poetic rendering of the creation narrative says, and God blew into humanity the very breath of life. You and I are breathing borrowed breath. So I ask again, what do you have that you have not received? And even for those whose lives have been one story after another of hardship and challenge, in your deepest and most prayerful moments, you know that you couldn't have gotten where you are if God in God's providence had not seen fit to make sure you ran into some other folks along the way. In the very front of that book, With Head and Heart, the autobiography of Howard Thurman, it is dedicated, he says there, to the man in the railway station who restored my dreams. Because when he was trying to get out of where he was and move on to a place where he could receive more education, the intonations of racism in this nation were so fierce and so strong that a, a teenager was sitting in the railway station in Daytona Beach, Florida, crying his eyes out because they wouldn't let him on the train because the clerk who had to certify that he could get on the train said that your bag does not reach the spe uh, specifications that are necessary because it was a raggedy thing. It didn't have any handles. This is pre-TSA, y'all. And a man who remains nameless to this day, apparently working in the radio, uh, railway station, one arm, a pack of cigarettes curled up in his shirt sleeve, comes up to Thurman and says, boy, what you crying about? Thurman pours out his story quickly, and the man makes provision for that raggedy suitcase. <laughs> to become in that moment what it needs to become in order that this boy could get on a train and get to school to get an education. And he dedicates the book, not to mama and grandmama, not to daddy and granddaddy, not to the preacher, but to a nameless man that God put in his pathway who when all of his dreams for something better were dashed on the rocks of our isms. This man was God's instrument to restore those dashed hopes and dreams. There are no self-made people. 
And so I ask of you, what do you have <laughs> that you have not received? God knows if you look at the human condition and think of our sinfulness and brokenness and alienation and estrangement from God and from neighbor, God knows we couldn't save ourselves. I mean, the, the wreckage of history of, of humanity's trying to fix humanity's dilemma, not that we should not be participants in a better life and a better world, but at the end of the day, we could not do what only God in Christ has done for us. And it is offered to us our salvation, abundant life, whatever vocabulary you apply, it is offered to us as a gift. We say with Paul and others, we are what we are by the grace and the mercy of God. Paul said to the Ephesians, we were lost and dead in our trespasses. But God, in God's mercy, began to weave and narrate and write a different story. Do you understand the poetry and the impact of that life? We were dead, walking around dead. Broken, lost, in darkness, no way out. And through no conception or plans or scheming of our own, God in Christ said, I'm going to flip the script and write a different ending. Thanks be to God for the gift of salvation. Thanks be to God that where we started as a human family, individually, collectively, all of our isms and brokenness and pain and alienation and rage was not the end of our story. God in Christ saw fit that our past didn't need to define our futures. So I came by tonight to Greenville, North Carolina to ask you, what do you have that you have not received? We're not even capable of fixing ourselves, but God. <laughs> oh, I wish I had time to go down the but God route tonight. <laughs> but God, in God's mercy. I was, I was in Philadelphia probably six years ago, and there was kind of this reunion of, of the church my wife grew up in, and, and I saw a young woman, um, and uh, uh, I hadn't seen her in 30 years, Cynthia and I together. Cynthia used to be her Sunday school teacher, and uh, as an adolescent, she was just, just, she was just a wreck. I mean, she just, I mean, she just had attitude on steroids. I mean, literally, if you said up, she said down. She could turn a Sunday school class on its ear. And it was that stage at which she, she and her mother just could not communicate at all. And somehow or another, her mother said, Cynthia, I wonder if you could just sort of informally, I mean, we're not going to make a statement. This was before the word mentoring was popular. This is, this is in the early 70s. Could, could you do something to help my child? Because she's headed for destruction. Now, she knew how to just go around the edge, <laughs> but not jump off the cliff. We saw Diane the other year. She was dressed up in an evening gown, and uh, we were at a church banquet. She's married to a big-time preacher, is the executive pastor of the church. Help me, Lord. And so when I saw her, I said, girl, look where the Lord brought you from. And, and, and just like church folks do, I began to narrate her past. I said, girl, when you were 14, couldn't anybody do anything with you? And, and I began to delineate all of that. And she stepped back and she said, but Bishop, God in his mercy. And she went to testifying about the goodness of the Lord and how the Lord had picked her up, turned her around, 
And I came by tonight to ask you, if you've been picked up and turned around, what do you have that you have not received? And even for all of you who are goody two-shoes, been in the church all your life, say you haven't lived a bad life, you haven't been bad. Listen, it ain't about that. No matter how good you think you are, until you move from your sense of autonomy, Tillich would say, to a sense of theonomy, moving from self-reliance to God-reliance, you don't hear me tonight. You're not ever going to be all you ought to be. So don't get too enamored with your goodness. Even that is the guess why the playing field is level at the foot of the cross. <laughs> you know, the goody two shoes folks got to stand there with the reprobates <laughs> and the folks that everybody wrote off. And I tell you, only a God, the God made known in Jesus Christ, could pour out that kind of grace and mercy into the church and into the world. And the question for us is, what do you have that you've not received? So Paul's talking to church folks. And they're arguing over their apostleship. I know Paul wanted to say, seriously? <laughs> arguing over their giftedness. I want you to know that churches as institutions and the United Methodist Church as no exception, we have become so focused on our entitlements and our privileges, I'm talking about in the church, I'm not talking about the protection of law, just in the church. I mean, it's, it's crazy. We've gone plumb crazy. How do I know that? Because we gotta have a title and a certificate to serve Jesus. Are you kidding me? I mean, if this thing is in you and it's overflowing, you can't hold it back. You don't have time to get a title and a certificate to say a word for Jesus and given all that he's done for you. What do you have that you haven't received? And if the gift is overflowing, it's got to come out somewhere. Now, I'm not saying we don't need training. God knows we do. But you already, my, the people, John Edgar and his wife are here from West Ohio. They can see, where, where are you, John and uh, Sue? Where are you? You're somewhere in here. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm not busting you out. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to say, he can tell you that ad nauseum in West Ohio, they say, we're so tired, not, not John and Sue, but the other, we're so tired of the bishop saying, you already have everything you need to take the next faithful step in ministry. And I came to tell you it's not a cliche. <laughs> it's not a word game. I may not all be all I ought to be, but I really believe that. Every one of us, every congregation already has everything it needs to take the next faithful step in ministry. I don't care how many folks you got or how many you wish you had. You already got everything you need. The Bible narrates all the people who thought they couldn't step up to the plate even when they knew it was God calling them. They became articulate, even people that couldn't talk became articulate at making excuses. I mean, it's crazy. When they wanted to say, oh, no, you already have. But, but we've been given so much. We don't have time to be arguing about our apostleship. The world needs apostolic ministry. And we don't have the luxury 
of spending our time in an ecclesiastical corner trying to figure out who is the chief apostle. That's not going to do anything to feed hungry people. It's not going to do anything to engage in public policy advocacy in Raleigh or in Washington, D.C. It's not going to stop gun violence in this nation. We need apostleship. And we are supposed to be the chief apostles of love. We have everything we need because God has given us so much not only would save us, but then gift us beyond measure. So if we're going to be a giving church, I know you all thought this was about money. <laughs> and the bishop will be scolding me later, but, you know, what's the point of giving you money if you ain't got your heart straight? Because you might be deluded into thinking you're buying something that can't be bought. What you're trying to buy maybe has already been paid for at a great price. Way out on Calvary's hill. Is it all right to talk about Jesus in here? I mean, he hung, bled, died. And they thought they had it. put the seal of the empire on the stone in front of the tomb. But early Sunday morning, because God is a giving God. God said, yeah, you know, Rome, you may be doing your thing, but I ain't through yet. I, I mean, I, I made that stone. Are you serious? Because God's intention was to keep pouring, pouring that love out into the world. That's what resurrection is about. When we're dead in our hatreds, God's love lifts us. Hmm. The old hymn writer said, I was sinking <laughs> deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master, of the sea, heard my despairing cry, and from the waters lifted me. Now safe am I, but, but the refrain has all the theology. Love lifted me. Your hate, self-hate, any haters couldn't keep me down. Love lifted us. What do you have that the master didn't give to you? So if we're going to be generous people, and we are called to be generous, if we're going to give until a redeeming difference is made in us and in any outcomes we pray for, we must begin to see everything as gift. Life, the created order, our salvation, and so much more. See, we don't have a money deficit. We got a gratitude deficit. Hmm. I, let me, I believe I'll say that again. I liked it myself. <laughs> we do not have a money problem. There's no money problem in this room, or, nor in any of the rooms in the churches where you, there's no money problem in there. But there may be a gratitude problem. <laughs> there may be a gratitude problem. Sometimes the hymns of the church have to draw it out of me, as you may have already come to recognize. I love that hymn, Come Thou Fount, of every blessing. But my favorite verse is, is verse number three, O oh, to grace. How great a debtor. Daily, 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 I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Sometimes my heart wanders and I get to thinking I'm here because I'm, you know, I got it going on. 
And then I make the mistake of looking at myself in the mirror and I said, really? <laughs> I mean, because I feel like the triune God is looking at me saying, seriously, dude? <laughs> I mean, doesn't the Lord talk to you like that? I mean, <laughs> oh, to grace, how great a debtor. So we prepare and we sustain ourselves as people called to give <laughs> all that we are and all that we have in response to all that we've received. And after all, Paul says, what do you have that you did not first? receive. Paul was astonished at the generosity of those who gave out of seemingly nothing to the offering for the saints in Jerusalem. But the key, as it is narrated, more than suggests that first they gave themselves. They understood that their material gifts may have been small if compared to others, but if given out of hearts of gratitude overflowing, they were gifts writ large, and they gave disproportionately to their means. Now here's, here's, here's the other thing that, that amazes me in that, that text is Paul says, and they begged us. I mean, we were going to give them a pass. I mean, you know, after all, they're poor. I mean, if you want to run me up the pole in my annual conference is to hear the wrong conversation about less wealthy populations in or out of the church and their capacity to give. Because I know that capacity starts here. And everybody has received and everybody has a need to give out of response to however little or however much they've received. And even folks who are chronically and generationally poor, materially speaking, it is no, there is no equation between poverty of spirit. It may be a distribution problem, but no poverty of spirit that automatically equates to poverty of means. So Paul said they begged us for the opportunity to participate in this great work. So I close on this wise. I, I, I look at their example and the examples of so many others and you'll hear You'll hear some stuff from Dr. Edgar in the next tomorrow that uh, will knock your socks off. And then I think about how much you and I, I mean, I don't have to know all your eye stories, but I can, you know, I'm just looking at what you're wearing. I, I took a quick survey of the parking lot, and, you know, I mean, you, you, the Lord has been kind to you. <laughs> I mean, no point in you poor mouthing. And I think about all that I've received, tangible and intangible. And I'm clear, I owe everything. But the more gratitude floods my heart, the less of an obligation it feels. I'm saying, put me in, coach. I want to give and give and give until my giving might just feebly approximate the generosity of God. 
So the hymn writer said, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life and my all. What do you have? that you did not receive.